Good morning, everyone. It's good for me to be here. I'm Tom Grable. And so some of you don't know me. Some of you do. I've lived in Zealand longer than I haven't lived in Zealand. So maybe that technically makes me a Zealander. But if you've been placed here from some other place, we're in good company. Because we're, uh, we're, but we're with, with good people that have been born and raised here as well. I was a pastor at First Reformed Church in Zealand for all 30 of those years. And just recently I stepped away into the unknown on a journey of faith in God that he will provide the next step. So um, with Pastor Eric and Erica going on vacation this week for spring break, it was a natural for him to say, hey, Tom, would you cover for me and preach on uh, the 8th? I said, yes, I would love to do that. I've got nothing else going on in my life right now. I serve on the, um, on the uh, advisory board for the Foundry, and so I do stay connected with you, and I meet with Pastor Eric every Wednesday that it works out in our schedule. Just get together for coffee and talk and a chat, and then he brags up this church a lot. And so uh, he is pretty proud of the people here. So it's with that that I'm excited to share with you from God's Word in this place. Uh, speaking of spring break, Michelle, my wife, and I are in a unique opportunity that we aren't bound by our children's schedules to determine where and when we go on vacation. And so we have been exploring going out during these cold months of the year to get away somewhere warm, like some of you did, and maybe many who would be here but are still traveling back from Florida. Good choice this week if anybody goes somewhere warm. It was just not very nice here. Um, and so a couple years ago, we decided to do a dream vacation out to Arizona. Been to Arizona? Sedona, Arizona? So we, we had visions of nice warm weather, and mountains, and hiking, and uh, somebody told us we need to do a pink Jeep tour. You've been on a pink Jeep tour? I'm like, what's a pink Jeep tour? So said, well, you can, go, you, can, uh, you can go in a pink Jeep. I don't know what the significance of pink Jeep is, but it's going to take you places where you can't hike yourself up the rugged terrain into great vistas to see beautiful scenery, and it's just the most exciting thing, so you got to do it. Like, okay, we're going to do a pink Jeep tour. Research online, and you know what pink Jeep tours cost? More than a pastor's salary will allow him to take indulge in, right? So we just kind of dismissed that, said, no, we're just going to do the free stuff, the stuff we like the most. We can indulge ourselves a little bit more with dinners out, but uh, we will uh, skip the, the pink Jeep tour. We arrive in Sedona, beautiful weather. They just had cold weather. There's still snow at the, the Grand Canyon, but here in Sedona, Arizona, it's beautiful weather. And Michelle and I uh, venture out on our first day. We stop at the visitor center. Always stop at the visitor center so you can get the right maps so you don't get lost and find out what there is to do. While we're in the visitor center, we overhear a conversation between the attendant at the desk and a cup, another nice couple who is visiting there about Jeep tours. I heard that, that phrase, and I listened closely, and I realized that they were talking about a way to get a Jeep tour for free. Now, when you're on a pastor's salary, you always listen to the word free, and you get excited, especially when it's in connection with a Jeep tour, possibly even a pink Jeep tour, which I said is a, a wonderful thing to do, I'm told. So uh, we listen a little closely. We uh, talk to the attendant. Says, "Yep, there is such a thing as a free jeep tour. All you need to do is uh, go listen to a spiel." Oh, listen to the groans. You've been there too, right? Well, Michelle and I had never been to uh, one of those spiels, um, but she assured us that it was low pressure. Honestly, there's just a new development in town that wants to get the word out, so they're just giving away free Jeep tours to people who will come and spend an hour with them, and um, you there's no obligation to purchase a timeshare. So we talked it over. We were a little suspicious. You know, a lot of people have told us bad stories about the spiel with the timeshare and how much pressure they are. And so we're not sure if we trust this person, but uh, after all, they're the visitors bureau, right? So they ought to know what they're talking about. Plus, it was our first day of vacation. We had the time. Let's just give an hour and we'll go to <clears throat> listen to this spiel and get our free Jeep tour. Well, in the end, we did get our free Jeep tour, but barely... We were determined not to go to Sedona to purchase any real estate, and we were there for three hours. Three hours! At the end of the day, it was grueling, it was miserable. 
Um, I'm contributing to the horror stories of the timeshare spiels. We were, we were deceived, and, um, and, the, and the Jeep tour itself wasn't worth the three hours of agony of listening to the spiel, let me tell you. Our daughter, our youngest daughter, Mallory, she's at the University of Michigan, and she's uh, just finishing her junior year, but she had a wonderful opportunity this past semester to travel abroad through a program through the University of Michigan where she could study in Ireland. That sounds nice, doesn't it? Yeah, and um, so she's making these plans and got everything all set up. She's renting an apartment in Ann Arbor with a friend, and so she's got to pay for rent throughout the summer or find someone to sublet from her. Together, she and her roommate found a gal, a friend of a friend, who agreed to sublet the apartment for the semester. And as it got closer to the end of the fall semester, suddenly my daughter gets an email from this gal who committed to sublet saying another option came up, she's going to have to back out. She, my daughter calls devastated and furious, as you can imagine, because now it's crunch time. How am I going to find somebody to take on this rental at this late a notice? And I've already paid my deposits and bought my airline tickets to go to Ireland. I'm going to end up paying for stuff that I'm not taking advantage of, and I don't have that kind of money. So she's beside herself because this person committed to something, gave their word to something, and then backed out. Here's what I want us to think about this morning. What is the impact of a broken promise? Someone leads you to believe something, and you believe them and trust them, and then it never happens, or it happens differently than they said, or they just break their promise altogether. What is the impact of that? You've all experienced it, haven't you? Pain? Anger? Frustration? Certainly you don't trust them anymore, do you? The impact of a broken promise from a friend, a family member, perhaps somebody in your neighborhood or somebody you work with. Maybe it's a mechanic you had a bad experience with, and now all mechanics can't be trusted, or a doctor, a physician. Or maybe you've been scammed by somebody who pretended to be somebody they weren't just to take advantage of you, and you felt the pain of loss giving in to that scam. Or maybe it's the political system that you have thought you could trust, and now you realize it's not working out the way you had thought. But you've all been there. You've all experienced it, the rip, the pain, the loss of trust. It's hard to trust anyone in this world today, isn't it? But what about you? Do you think you've ever broken a promise or acted in a way that has shattered the trust of somebody else important in your life? Of course you have. Even if you don't realize it, if you don't think it, it's true. You've done things, said things, behaved in a particular way, made choices that have put others in a position of not wanting to trust you any longer, standing at a distance. What once was a thriving relationship is now been uh, dis distanced. Sometimes we do it intentionally. We're just in anger. We, we just can't help it, but we, we demonstrate it in a way that is intentional to hurt others. Most of the time, it's unintentional, right? I don't make a decision one day to say, I'm just going to go off and I'm going to drink until I don't, can't remember anything anymore, and I'm going to go around to the people closest to me, and I'm going to say bad things to them and maybe hit them physically and wound them and hurt them. Most people don't do that kind of stuff, but we just somehow unintentionally break our promises and live behaviors that are hurtful to relationships. Friends, we make big promises all the time, don't we? Do you remember, those of you that are married, do you remember your wedding day when you stood up, maybe in a church, maybe out in a field somewhere, you stood before God and witnesses and you made a vow, you made a pretty big vow that day, right, that I am going to live my entire life committed to this person. And I'm going to care for this person and demonstrate love consistently to this person. And I'm going to stay faithful to this person, right? You make that promise. It's easy on your wedding day. And then you come up against the struggles and hardships of life. And that's when it's hard to fulfill that covenant completely. And that's when the wounds start happening. And that's when the distancing starts taking place, right? We make big promises with 
big gains in, in hope, but then these things happen. But do you remember when you were baptized or when you baptized your child or you made profession of faith? You remember that day, how great and exciting it was to stand before God and say, I love you and I commit myself to following Jesus as Lord, but yet you didn't understand what it meant to follow Jesus as Lord, did you? Because you thought it just meant I get a free ticket into heaven and everything on earth is going to be easy and comfortable because God's going to demonstrate his love and that's what people who love you do. They just... They make it easy. They take all the pain and the hardships away, right? And never did you realize that what you were making a commitment to was really a life of mission. You were going to have to take risks. You were going to have to do things you'd never done before for the sake of others rather than the sake of yourself. And how many times have you knowingly or unknowingly said, I'm going to let somebody else take care of that. I recognize there's a need, but eh, that's not for me. You know, every time you complain about the broken things of this world that you wish were different, there's really an invitation for, by God for you to step in and do something perhaps to redeem it and reconcile it. And when you say, no, nah, no, I'm going to let somebody else do it, you're breaking that covenant, that promise that you made. We do it all the time. See, that's the sad thing. We're in this sad, sorry state of a world in which promises are broken all the time and people are deeply impacted and pained by them. And then what can we do about it? What's it like to realize that you've broken faith and you can't change it? What's done is done and it can't be undone. I don't know if you're anything like me, but the first instinct is to defend myself. Uh-uh, it didn't happen. I never did that. I never said that. No, it was my fault. You can't pin this all on me. What about every time you do? Or what about the circumstance? I just had a bad day, right? You can understand. I'm taking this out on you because people were taking it out on me all day, as if that's a legitimate defense. Or we take it in the other realm. I realized what I did, and I blew it, and now I'm filled with shame. And I just need to be alone in my misery and a sense of hopelessness washes over us. You know, if this is all it is, is just this cycle of brokenness uh, and, and mistrust, there's not a whole lot of reason to live, is there? Friends, we just celebrated Easter last week. Pretty important day in the life of the church, and I'm just not ready to, to leave that too quickly. I want to stay there. I want to stay there at the cross. I want to stay with Jesus, our Savior, and I want to reflect a little bit more because I think there's some things that, that definitely address the sorry state of existence in this world. And I want to share with you some stories from Scripture, some powerful stories that um, seem rather ridiculous to us. If, if you get that feeling like that's just ridiculous, you're not alone. That's what I was feeling as I was reading those, kind of like that feeling I had when Jordan Poole was open and he shot at the buzzer and sank the basket to win the second game of the tournament so they could go on for this great trip to the finals of the basketball tournament. You know what I'm talking about. That was ridiculous, that shot. No more ridiculous than that Dante guy who just dominated the final game of the final four and took that victory away from the University of Michigan. There's just certain things that happen are just ridiculous. You can't explain it, but it's true. It did happen. Today, this morning, we want to talk about the doctrine of atonement and what the, the significance and importance of the doctrine of atonement is. So atonement, in a very simple way, at one meant. You know, broken promises, the promise is made, and it connects you with somebody. But then you break that promise, and you're split apart. And how do you bring that back together again? To one atonement. Otherwise, definition would be a satisfaction or reparation for a wrong or injury, something that makes amends. The doctrine concerning the reconciliation of God and humankind is accomplished through the life, suffering, and death of Christ. I want to go back to Christ right after Easter so that we can understand the doctrine of atonement. Um, I want us to look at the Gospel of Luke Luke chapter 23, if you want to follow along in your Bibles, I'm, I'm reading from Luke 23, story of Jesus on the cross, the resurrection hasn't happened yet, and um, 
It's a pretty cool story, as only recorded by Luke. Luke says in verse 32, two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. And when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him alone with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. So Jesus didn't get crucified alone that day. There were two others in the wings that had done horrible things and merited, according to the Roman minds, punishment by the most cruel form of punishment known crucifixion. You see three crosses there in the picture. And while they're hanging on the cross, Jesus in the center, the two other criminals on the other sides, they're exchanging words. And one of them, pretty critical, pretty uh, blasphemous words, he's ridiculing Jesus, saying, you claim to be the Son of God, well, go ahead and save yourself and us, if you really can. He's being cruel, he's being wicked, he's being judgmental, he's making a fool out of himself, to which the other crook on the other side has some sympathy for Jesus in the center. And he rips on the other guy for saying such offensive words. Don't you know who you're talking to? And he says, Ben, to Jesus, Jesus, will you remember me when you go into your kingdom? In fact, Wait a minute, let me get the exact words. Aren't you the Christ? No, no, no. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I thought it said Lord. But Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So one was ridiculing Jesus, just a human being in his mind, who claimed to be something big. The other recognized that Jesus was something special and asked for his mercy to remember him in his kingdom. I think the most ridiculous part is that Jesus' response. As Jesus is hanging there after suffering greatly at the cruelty of his own people, the religious people, of everyone who's standing around observing him standing on the cross, bleeding in anguish, suffocating from the weight of his own body hanging on the cross, They're ridiculing him just like the crook on the one side of him. And in the midst of all this, Jesus says these words as only Luke records, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. That's ridiculous. You and I would never say anything like that under extreme conditions, being treated so offensively for no reason at all, unjustly, unfairly. We would never plead for their forgiveness. Give it to them, Lord. You give it to them. Give it all you got. Pour out your wrath on these people who are so stubborn and so cruel. Well, maybe we're in the crowd and we realize that we're the ones that are doing the betraying. We're the ones who are guilty. And we stand dumbfounded to hear Jesus say, Father, forgive him, forgive her, for she knows not what she does. I've treated you so poorly. How can you be so gracious? That's ridiculous. Forgive them? Don't Hold this against them. Give them a second chance, even a third chance, either a fourth chance. Don't destroy them. Why would Jesus say such a thing? Jesus saw that this was the way for people to be brought together again with God at one. If he would die so that God could forgive, they could be brought back together again. They could be reconciled to God, to each other, to their true selves, which has been forgotten along the way. In Jesus' mind, this was the only hope for this world, was that we would be reconciled. And this cycle of broken promises and abuse would be gone through the act of atonement. He goes on to say, They don't know what they're doing. And you say, of course they know what they're doing. 
They're shouting back blasphemous stuff. They hung you on the cross. They made false accusations. They knew exactly what they're doing. Don't lay them off the hook. But Jesus knew something that they didn't know, that there's something called brokenness, sinfulness. Your true spirit has been broken. And out of that brokenness, they make decisions, poor decisions, selfish decisions, evil decisions. And Christ's like, with God's help, that brokenness can be healed. And when that healing takes place, you're reconciled more to your true self. And in your true self, you can recognize, reconcile with those who have hurt you. And you can reconcile with God, your Father. It's like a child who eats a whole box of cookies when you told them they could have one. And you say, why did you do that? And they say, I don't know. Or a teenager gets caught cheating on exam and you're saying, why did you do that? And they said, I don't know. It's true. They were caught up in the emotion of whatever it was. We get caught up in our emotion of our brokenness, and then we act without thinking. We just react to it. And oftentimes, we can regret it later once we discover the error of our ways. But many times, we don't even discover it because we want to blame everyone else for my problems and my situation. People, the atonement. The act of Christ on the cross offers us hope when all else seems hopeless. Let's look at another story of the Bible. This one goes way back to the Old Testament, Old Testament book of Exodus, to another powerful and great leader of his day. In fact, the Jewish people, who Jesus was a Jew, was connected to, who crucified him, they believed he was the greatest leader of all times. His name was Moses. Heard of him? Don't know his last name? This is the Moses, the one who rescued the people out of slavery in Egypt. Let me give you a little background. So God calls on Moses to be a leader for him. What qualified him to be a great leader? Some would say it's because he was groomed to be the next pharaoh of Egypt. Even though he was a Hebrew, he grew up in the palace, and he had the strictest education and training to become the next pharaoh because there was no other male descendant in line. So Moses was to be that one. But at the age of 40, he murdered an Egyptian forfeited his right to the throne and almost got himself killed, but he fled and wandered for another 40 years. What made him a great leader, God knew, and nobody else knew, not even Moses at the time, but we're going to discover it. So Moses is called by God to be this great leader, of which he doesn't see himself, but God uses him to deliver them to the, into the desert, not quite to the promised land that he had promised them where they could establish, they could, they could settle down, they could raise their families and become a nation. But God delivered them to the desert, to the base of the mountain, and there he established a covenant. He made a promise that he would deliver them the rest of the way into this land where they could become a nation at peace without threat of war. And then God said, the stipulation is what I ask of you is that you just abide by these top ten commandments, which we are well aware of, the ten commandments. And God, in great um, drama, dramatic fashion, declared what these ten commitments are on the mountain with thunder and lightning and a loud booming voice. And the people, shaking in their boots, took God seriously and said, we will do everything you tell us to do. They established a covenant. They made a promise to God and God to them. And then God called Moses, his great leader, up onto the mountain so they could have a conversation. The first thing Moses received from God was stone tablets with all these stipulations written on them because the tendency is to forget. I heard it once, out of sight, out of mind, we forget what we promised. So Moses receives the tablets, and then he lingers a little longer so they can talk about things like setting up the tabernacle with all the specifics that uh, God had in mind. And lo and behold, 40 days go by. That's a long time, right? And for these Israelites, these Hebrew people who had just left Egypt, and are now sitting in the desert, it's a little bit uncomfortable in the desert. Arizona's kind of desert, but you know, there's some modern conveniences now, so we were pretty comfortable, but they were not very comfortable in the desert where they were, but they had what they needed, but you know, over time, they become restless. 
And in their discomfort, they start making some selfish demands. The true self is starting to come out. And so they go to Aaron, because Moses isn't there. They assume Aaron is now the boss, and they pressure him, put peer pressure on him to build them something, uh, an idol in the shape uh, of gods that they can worship. Because the God who delivered us is no longer around, and this leader who was next in command is no longer around. don't even know what's happened to him. Make us some gods. Aaron doesn't want to uh, have a, a riot, and so he conforms to what they say. Give me your gold jewelry, and he fashions it into a calf, a golden calf. I think we have a, a picture of that. There we go. Look at this, this idol. Um, and, and I want you to, to notice what's on his head because I'm going to reference to that a little bit later. But a calf, they wanted to, to form a god that they could worship in this time because the absence of the other god and, um, and help them out in, uh, in their troubled times. Um, and uh, God is watching this. God sees what the people are doing, even though they think they're getting away with it. Nobody's going to know. We can, we can build an idol. We can do what we want to do because God's not around. But they don't escape God's uh, view. And so God says to Moses, you need to go back down. You need to go back down the mountain because the people are acting inappropriately. In fact, um, God says they are stiff-necked. They're a stiff-necked people. Uh, Leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them, that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. Now, this slide helps you understand what a stiff neck is all about, but I I have to laugh because every time I preach from this passage, I get this horrible stiff neck. It's painful. I'm like, Shal, could you please rub it out and make it feel better? Um, And and we're tempted to believe that they were just people who uh, just had whiplash and they were walking around with stiff necks. But no, what, what the term stiff-necked meant for the ancient Hebrew people was that they were stubborn. See, they would use oxen to plow the fields, and the oxen sometimes had a a mind of their own, and they would want to do their own thing, either keep going straight when the farmer wanted them to turn, or they would turn when the farmer wanted them to go straight. So he had a stick with a pointy spear on the end, and he would flick them if they were being stiff-necked or stubborn. Just like a a mule sometimes can be referred to as stubborn. They do what they want to do, regardless of what you want them to do. And so God was saying, these are a stiff-necked people. They are stuck in their ways. They refuse to do something new and obey anything but what they feel like doing. In this area, there's a popular phrase called stiff cup. Heard of it? Dutch phrase? means you're a stubborn Dutchman, right? Do you know any stubborn Dutchmen? Some giggles, because you do. You know, uh, last time I preached this, guys would come, and my wife was just elbowing me in the side because they knew I'm, I'm pretty stubborn. We're set in our ways. We've done it this way for so many years. I'm not doing anything different, right? I don't care if there's a better way. This is the way I like to do. That's, that describes perfectly the people uh, of Moses' day. And uh, remember the golden calf, the idol that first got them in trouble? They began, uh, after they had, they had the idol, then they started to um, act in revelry, it says. Music, dancing, drinking, and consumption, and orgy. Now, if this doesn't make sense to you, it's all right, because there's some missing information. Remember, they came from Egypt. They had just come from Egypt. And if you go back to ancient Egyptian uh, history, you realize that they worshipped many different gods. Let's flip over to um, that that goddess Hathor, and you see this looks very Egyptian, right? What's that crown on her head remind you of? The calf, right? There was an ancient Egyptian god, Hathor, who had the horns and the sun in the mid- middle, and she was the goddess of love, but more erotic love, music, and dancing. And the way that you worshipped this God is you engaged in these forms of revelry. 
and delight. And so while God's away and while the leader's away, they could engage in these old practices that kind of stimulated the excitement and gave them a feeling of life. They were practicing the old ways of living. They were stuck in their ways. And God's trying to develop a new nation to do something new, to glorify himself. So what they've done is they've abandoned the true God to go back to the old gods so they could stay stuck in their old way of being. And God wanted nothing to do with this. And so he sent Moses back to them. And when Moses came down the mountain, he saw this revelry going on. They saw the idol that they were worshiping. To, and, and he was reminded, because he had the tablets right there in front of him, of the first commandment, you should not make any idols. You should not bow down and worship them because I am a very jealous God. They had broken the stipulation of the covenant. They had shattered their, their, their promises, broken their promises. And the result was that God was furious with them. Moses, as a show of, of display of the reality was, he took those tablets and he threw them down on the ground and they shattered into a thousand pieces as if to say, the promise has been broken. You're on your own. God is no longer your God. powerful realization of what they had done and the impact of the broken promise. And I just wonder if those Hebrew people would walking through the camp would come across those shattered stones and pick one up and look at it and say, oh my word, what have we just done? We do that, don't we? We break promises. We don't even realize what we've done until it's too late and there's a sense of hopelessness. But then there's a day later, Moses comes back to them and he says to them, you have committed a great sin, but now I will go up to the mountain. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sins. That word, atonement. Moses has nothing at stake here. He's free to go and, and become a nation of himself or with his ancestors. It's just not with these people. But Moses says, no, no, I'm going to go up and see if I can make atonement for this wrongdoing that you made. And he goes up the mountain again, which is a great act for an 80-year-old man to go up a mountain to see with God. And he says to him, Oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods of gold. But now, please forgive them. But if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. You know what made Moses great was not that he was brought up in the palace and had all these great credentials, but that he was sympathetic, graceful, and forgiving willing to offer atonement, make personal sacrifices on behalf of a great people so that they might have another chance to prove themselves as faithful. And what made Moses this way is because he learned from the broken covenant he made when he murdered that Egyptian and wandered 40 years in the presence of God in order to realize that God had forgiven him so greatly for his sin. That's what happens when we realize, when we come to terms to come to accept our own brokenness and the price that is paid for our broken promises and the way we treat other people out of the broken parts of our lives. And then we realize that God made a way of hope through that by making personal sacrifices for me. And then he starts to heal these broken parts of our lives that we're finally willing to own up to and confess to and make some commitments to live differently. And then we start to see other people differently. And we start to live with a spirit of willingness to forgive, to offer grace and atonement, even at personal sacrifice. That's spiritual transformation. There's another great story in the Bible that's just as ridiculous as these first two. It's uh, about Stephen, a lesser-known character. It's in Acts chapter 7. I'm going to give that to you to read up and, and, and hear from Stephen some of the same things which allowed him to eventually act in a way of atonement, but not, not for us here in this place. One of the things that I do recognize there is that he, uh, he did confront those who were 
turning against him, using the same words that God used for the people of of Israel back in Exodus, you stiff-necked people. By direct confrontation, it didn't work. They got pretty angry and picked up stones and tried to throw them at him. So he turned around to see what he, to do what he saw Jesus do on the cross and said, Father, don't use this against them. Give them another chance. Friends, this world is in chaos. There's problems and 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 um, immorality all around us. We fear it. We fear it for our kids, our grandkids. What do we do? Jesus gives us a way. First is to receive his atoning work on the cross, recognizing that as Moses atoned for the sins of the Hebrew people, Stephen atoned for the, the, the sins of the Jewish people, Jesus atoned for the sins of all people at that time and into the future so that we might have a second chance. We realize that the spirit-filled life is a life of atonement, receiving God's free gift and then offering it to others, as ridiculous as it may seem. I want to tell you about a friend of mine who is in prison right now, serving a sentence. I want to tell you a little bit about his background. Grew up in a home with a dad who abandoned him at a very young age, and a mom, a single mom, who didn't know how to raise her two boys and was in and out of relationships. Heavy drinker. From a young age, he felt alone and abandoned and needed to fend for himself. As a teenager, he he joined a gang and did all kinds of violent things and um, took up not only doing drugs but dealing drugs, habits that would live with him on into his adult life and eventually catch up to him and land him in prison. Now, prison is a place where we want people who make bad choices, who do things that will hurt others to be for a period of time, and that's where he is. And I go to visit him once a month. And um, I I do this partly because, uh, largely because I realize that I'm imperfect. I've made many mistakes, and God has not given up on me, and maybe I can be an agent of reconciliation for this young man that his life could be turned around. And it's amazing what God has done in his life as he's come to know God, stop blaming God, but taking ownership of his own issues, reading scripture, exploring scripture, allowing the spirit of God to come in and say, I'm going to live my life differently as I get out of prison. You would think all those people are hopeless. There's no good for them. They're just rotten people. And then you realize the stories like this happen by people who, like you and I, who receive the forgiveness of Christ and then offer it freely to others who've also made mistakes in the hope that they will be transformed. Not everybody is transformed, not in our lifetime, but it is the way forward as God gives to us. Friends, you and I have been hurt by the impact of broken promises. This has been resulted in the difficulty of trusting God and others We also have broken promises and hurt others, and they find it difficult to trust us. But this is not all there is, not what done is is what's done. But Jesus made a way through his sacrifice on the cross to atone for our sins so that as we draw nearer to him, we can experience the transformation the Spirit wants to bring, and we can be reconciled to a deeper and deeper relationship with God with those we've hurt and those that we love so much, and with our truer selves. This is the way of grace and forgiveness. Today I want you to receive the assurance of forgiveness. Whatever you've done, whoever you've hurt, how deep it's gone, Christ paid the price for you. You can let go of the shame that accompanies it and binds you, or the need to defend yourself by blaming other people rather than taking ownership and responsibility for the wrongs you've done and allow the Holy Spirit to bring about transformation and change in you. It may seem ridiculous and hard to understand, but it's powerfully redemptive. It's what you need. It's what the world needs. It's what's going to bring about hope. Let's pray and ask God to make this happen. Heavenly Father, it's been good to be worshiping in this place and to be singing these songs about grace and forgiveness, but it's, it's when we experience true uh, 
in that time in which we encounter with you and we, when we're, we, we know for certain that the guilt and the shame is gone and that you have given us another chance that we really realize the power and the importance of this faith that you call us to. We thank you for Jesus and the sacrifice he made on the cross. We thank you for heroes like Moses and Stephen and we thank you for the changed lives of people uh, in prison and outside of prison who have done things that have been hurtful. We pray that the church would rise up and seek reconciliation to receive your atonement so that we can be a blessing of hope in this broken world. And we pl pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, as you depart from here, may the Lord continue to speak to you throughout the week that you are his. You are a child of God. Yes, you are. He loves you very much and wants to transform those broken parts to give you the fullness of life. And not only you, but the fullness of others around you. So go in the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and in fellowship with the Holy Spirit and be transformed. Amen.